Hi there, it's Pat McDonald, your host for A Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Joining me tonight as co-host is Ken, Ken, is that your name, Ken? <laughs> ben Kinsley, not, not unless sorry. I changed it. <laughs> <laughs> you can. Uh, ben Kinsley, we haven't been together in a little while. It's, it's been, been a while. A, it's, been a, it's been a minute. Well, we're just starting the new season. So, exactly. Yeah. It's our first time together. And joining us as guests, you will love this show, Mark Galley, who's a Detective Sergeant retired from Vermont State Police and a peer support specialist. We'll explain that in a minute. Bob Lucas, who is over here, Lieutenant retired from the Vermont State Police and a peer support specialist. And Sonny Provetto, who is a LICSW licensed social worker, director of Vermont Center for Responder Wellness. And we are talking tonight about training for frontline workers. And you will find this a very interesting show because I sure did doing the research. So, um, so that's what we're going to be doing, and we'll turn it over to Ben to kick us off. Yeah, so uh, we'll take a minute and uh, ask each of you to kind of introduce uh, yourselves and a little bit about um, what you do. And uh, so, Mark, we'll start with you and uh, give us a little bit about your background and, uh, and what you do, and then we'll kind of start diving into some of the details. Um, I started out as an EMS rescue worker with Colchester Rescue in 1979. So I spent about five, uh, almost six years with them uh, as an EMTI responding to calls. Uh, I then uh, went to law enforcement in 1983 and worked there through retirement in 2009 with the Vermont State Police, working with a couple of other local agencies prior to that. And um, I then went to UVM and worked as their part-time detective uh, to assist them with cases that they had. Mm. And around 2000, uh, the, en the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019, Sonny reached out to me and I ended up uh, working for him as a peer support specialist uh, when we were just starting into the program. It was very new. Excellent. Um, and Sonny, you've got quite a, quite a background, uh, which uh, I'm sure our, our viewers will be very interested in knowing about. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about that background and uh, um, what you're doing here in Vermont? Sure. Um, um, in 1988, I uh, came to Vermont and interviewed um, with um, the Burlington Police Department. Mark was on my oral board. He gave me my career in law enforcement. Uh, I spent 10 years, five years with the Burlington Police Department, five years with the state police, um, and then I got a medical retirement and always found an interest in uh, police mental health. And uh, Mark and I were one of some of the original members of the Vermont State Police Peer Support Team, which started in 1997. Um, graduated UVM and 9-11 happened and found myself at ground zero, uh, you know, providing uh, crisis mental health services for uh, first responders working on the pile and then uh, found my way th six months later into working with a police organization named PAPA, which stands for Police Officers Providing Peer Assistance, and that was for the New York City Police Department. And I spent seven and a half years developing my clinical skills and working uh, in that environment, um, doing uh, crisis intervention and counseling and uh, lots of critical incident uh, debriefings, and then Made my way back to Vermont, and um, uh, was Mike Sherling pulled me out of retirement and uh, said, uh, you know, we need some help with the PD uh, with some of our um, some of the tough cases that they had, and so uh, I came out and I started working with um, with Burlington Police Department first, and today I think we have 17 agencies. I do. So we <clears throat> we provide services for 17 agencies, and uh, the center was born in 2018 after. Um, re recognizing there's a huge need to treat the population and treat it in a way that we thought was best practices and evidence-based. And, um, and then Mark uh, joining me, and I knew his capacity to provide support for all of these agencies, and he had the credibility, and then uh, recognized that this was another avenue that the center could provide services. And then when, when Bob was, um, you know, when I knew Bob, who ran the Members Assistance Program, I knew that I would try to grab him when he retired. Um, and, Scoping them out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's been it's been a lot of fun working with these guys, and uh, it's not the clinical work that I do; it's really the peer support work that these guys do. I think that is most impactful. Excellent. Well, and Bob, you were 20 years in Vermont State Police, or a couple different agencies? No, just state, state police. Uh, yeah, started in 2002. Uh, worked my way up, up through the ranks. Uh, towards the end of my career, um, I was put in charge of the Members Assistance Program 
we did peer support with them, and that's really where I learned. Uh, I had a huge interest in this program, um, working with Sunny, uh, you know, both through the uh, Department of Public Safety and then kind of out, outside the the, uh, the department. Um, again, you know, we started having those conversations about uh, post, you know, post retirement. And uh, I am the newest guy to the, to the bunch. Uh, just came on in January, actually February of, of, of last year. So wow, just about a year. Excellent. Well, Sonny, you think he gave you, let you become a state trooper? He gave me my motorcycle license. I heard that you? story tonight. <laughs> no, you earned it. Oh, well, thank you. What That's a true. Smooth guy. But, so if there's anybody to blame, it's you, Mark. But, anyway. um, but Sonny, I wanted to talk, this whole issue about uh, first responders, um, First came to my attention in 2017 when the Vermont legislature heard testimony about workers' compensation, um, including PTSD. Um, I was at the Department of Labor at the time, um, and you were testifying on this bill a lot. What was the reason? Why was there resistance in the legislature? Because there was uh, to include uh, first responders uh, in workers' comp. What, but they obviously eventually changed their mind. But but what was the resistance? So I, I think there's a myth that um, somehow workers' comp is uh, an easy, uh, you know, uh, doorway to uh, not working and getting paid, which, you know, um, is not true at all. In, in the last five years since the law has been enacted, um, we've treated at the center um, seven first responders, and six of those first yeah. responders were able to go back to work and uh, live in healthy lives and, you know, doing good work and, and the Leaders in those organizations are really happy that they were able to get the resources to the officers or the firefighter quickly and, and you know, keep them healthy. And I think that was the goal, right? What I began to see prior to the law changing was officers suffering post-traumatic stress and not getting the resources. So in other words, if you look at the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress, the last category in uh, you know, meeting the qualifications is social and, prof and professional dysfunction. You can't work, right? So right. you have to meet seven different categories. It's a very tough diagnosis to, to meet all those categories. So what we saw was people who couldn't work, uh, and therefore they couldn't pay their bills. And so because you know PTSD is a stress-related disorder, you now compounded not only the fact that they were traumatized in serving their community, but now they are suffering you know, the stress that goes on in the family system around not working, not paying the bills, uh, and then all the issues that come with anger and, and hypervigilance and hyperreactivity. And so it, I, I saw people's mm. lives go down, the, go down the drain. And so in 2017, when I testified, it was very clear to me that, that the world of psychology had advanced so much that we knew so much more about how to treat first responders. And I said, you know, treating trauma in first responders is different. And they said, why? And I talked about EMDR, right, the psychotherapy that, that we specialize in at the center. And I thought the committees, like, believed and trusted in what we were saying. And, and Pat, I, my experience is a little different. There was no uh, first responder who runs an organization that, that said you shouldn't do this. There were some people who called me up and asked questions, and that was good enough for them. Uh, I thought the committees were favorable in saying this sounds like this is the right thing to do. Good. It was the insurance companies. Ah, blaming the wrong people. I'm sorry about that. No, 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 you're yeah. not blaming. No. You're inquiring. I'm yeah, inquiring. Okay, I'm inquiring. But, yeah, well, they don't want to, they don't want to add to their uh, responsibilities. But right? can I say one thing? Yes, please. One year of treatment. Right? Although you still have to pay that person's salary. That person's salary was already budgeted. Right, right. One year of treatment, every week, $3,600. Wow. wow. You, it cost over, well, huh. the, the numbers are different now, but yeah. the last time, so before inflation and COVID, for a Burlington police officer to go through the academy and then go through field training, it's $100,000 before that officer is on the road. So, by themselves. So just from a pure budgetary standpoint, right. it's cheaper to give that officer the mental health right. supports right. they need and get them back out on the, you know, back right. out on the streets or whatever. 
yes. than it is to right. train a whole new officer. Right. Yeah, to lose an officer, right? right. You can't put a, a price on experience. Right. Right. So you have a, and these are not right. the five year, six year person, right? This is the 15, 18 right. years, somebody who has a lot of experience and really is of value to the organization and their community. And, and all of a sudden they, they realize that, uh, you know, trauma, the Greek definition of trauma means wound, right? They realize that that they're injured and they come asking for help. And, you know, and, and the law was great because it's a presumption that it's work-related. And you know, the right. professions are so good at, we know every call that Bob Lucas went to in his career. We know the time, we know the date, and we know the location. And you know, the pushback has been, this was irresponsible of, uh, of me to uh, you know, kind of testify in the way that I did that said, we can do this. But Pat, we're doing it. You know? yeah, right. We're really doing it. Well, the, but I think mental, I mean, health in, its, in general has changed a little bit. Prevention. Although you're spending money up front, it saves a whole lot in the in the going forward. So they've learned maybe a little ounce of prevention or tr or treatment. Well, thank God for the Department of Labor. Yes, you know because <laughs> you, know, you because did something right. Yes, I did. So <laughs> what's really Can I speak to what's really happening like current in current time? The um, when when these clients, um, none of the insurance companies want to accept the claim because it Great. sets a precedence. Right. So they always get denied. So huh. there's this process that takes place where the, person, the police officer or the firefighter has to hire an attorney, and the attorney brings it to the Department of Labor. Right. The Department of Labor is the voice of reason that says, no, you know, based on the information, right. Right, you know, it's a presumption, and let's give the person their help. Um, that works out. That's the best case scenario. Yep. But what tends to happen is they deny the claim. Uh, the person doesn't get the money, and they use right. up all their sick time. And uh, you know the the attorneys try, and in COVID, just think about what that was like, right? right. Trying to get mm. the Department of Labor to hear a case, but in the meantime, the lives of these people hang in the balance, and they're serving our communities. I mean, the the least that we can do is even not accept the claim, but pay without prejudice. And right. some of the people who make these decisions refuse to pay for the services we provide them, even when they settle the claim, they refuse to write me personally a check, right? And, and some of these people we treat for years. Huh. So uh, there really is this log jam of understanding what the purpose and, and the utility of the workers' compensation. But I have to say one thing. Vermont was the first state, and from our perspective, you know, right. we, so somebody was in my office today, in, in the center today, who a year ago, was on the floor um, outside the center with a gun in his hand. And if it wasn't for Mark wow. and a few other people, uh, that person would, could have been a statistic. Whoa, that's kind and of And that weird. person today yeah. walked in, smiling, said, I just wanted to check in. And he's back to work and doing a great job. That's great. On that note, gentlemen, we're just going to take a moment to hear from our sponsors. And we'll be right back with you. Good time for a water break. Just a water break, water break. <laughs> And um, we're going to jump right in and talk about a couple things. I think what, kind of at the core of what we're talking about today is uh, um, you know, PTSD is a big piece of it. That's not the only piece of it. But I think that you know, the public is, is very aware now thanks to, um, <clears throat> thanks to uh, a lot of the advocacy that's been done for the military, like what mm -hmm. PTSD is. Mm -hmm. Um, but they usually think of it in, in terms of just that. It's, uh, it's military. Um, what I think you guys are trying to do is focus uh, on saying, hey, it's not just the military. Our first responders also see traumatic things. If you're a firefighter or a police officer and you're responding to something, um, you, see, you see a lot of stuff. Even EMTs, you see a lot of stuff. Uh, and, and those things can be traumatic. Um, and uh, PTSD is a real thing for first responders. Certainly many of the people that were in 9-11, uh, like you were saying, uh, a lot of them had, saw horrible things, um, and getting those folks the support they need because they are serving our community. Um, what what drew each of you in um, to to wanting to do this work and um, spending the you know spending a good portion of your careers doing it? Sonny, we'll start with you. I guess <laughs> since you're the patriarch here, I suppose. Uh, 
<laughs> the architect. Now. The architect. Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, and I'll just speak for myself because trauma is so subjective, right? Like, um, I saw things um, as a police officer, did my job because we train our police officers really well and our firefighters and allows us to perform. And, and, um, and then, you know, went to people who I, were my mentors and, and asked, what do I do with what I'm feeling, right? What my body is experiencing, whether it's, a, you know, the adrenaline, cortisol, or fragmented mm -hmm. memory of what just had happened. And we used to say, hey, we'll, we'll get something to drink after the shift and we'll meet in the dirt parking lot. And so I said, okay, and that's how we normalize. You know, peer support started with the title of Booze and Buddies, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Um, and then when peer support started with the state police, we got a, an education in, you know, um, critical instance stress management. We learned about stress and how it plays in the body and really oriented me to say, wow, there is, uh, there is something here that we can provide, give back to uh, our organization and our peers. Um, and the power of peer support is so effective, right? Uh, you know, brother, sister, brotherhood, sisterhood, you know, we rely on each other, you know, to have that talk and to, to feel that it's going to be okay. And, and that's what brought me, mm. you know, to do the work that, that really is kind of going to be, a, we, a, we hope that we can be doing this longer than we would be in cops. Huh. So in another 30 years. Excellent. A lot of good work. <laughs> Mark's not so sure Follow about that. that Don't put me around a hundred. <laughs> so, so Mark, we know that uh, already that uh, uh, Sonny kind of dragged you into this. But what what made you want to do this work? Uh, and what attracted you to doing this work? For, uh, well, uh, like I had mentioned, I started in '79 at Colchester Rescue. Um, we had a very informal debriefing process. Basically, the crew that I was on, my wife and friends. Um, it was absolutely normal for us to go on a call and talk about it uh, after the incident, after we restocked the rig and we're driving back. If it was a really troublesome call, we all talked about it to see how it impacted us. And what it did was it planted the seed to me that it was okay to be uncomfortable with something, but it also normalized it because other people were experiencing what I was experiencing, and I thought it was just me. Um, so that became very normal for me, and the actual the Colchester Rescue was very big because each uh, squad, each uh, unit and team would do the same thing. Uh, the crew itself would do it within themselves, plus as an agency we did it, which was good. So I was used to that. So when I got into police work in 83, that wasn't around. And it wasn't until 97 uh, that the state police reached out to us, Sonny, myself, uh, and there were eight other people, my wife was one of them. We, so we had civilians and we had law enforcement, we had dispatchers on that end, which covered the whole gamut, which was really very um, forthright of them to think about mm. covering everybody. Well, that's another one you don't think about necessarily is dispatchers, oh, it's the person yeah, on right. the other end of the phone that's mm -hmm. like m maybe trying to keep you alive right. while mm -hmm. first responders are getting oh, to yeah. you, right? Listening to someone screaming for right. help and not being able to do anything other than push a radio button and sending somebody and then not having the, you know, what's going on, right. how does it end? At least when the police officer goes, they deal with it, they know exactly what happened. And unless that information is fed back to the dispatcher, it's know. very, very troublesome for mm -hmm. them because, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're right on edge all the time. So when I realized that there was nothing and then the state police decided they wanted to do it, I said, I've been doing this all my life uh, prior to this. And so I said, I'm in. And I saw the benefit, and, and it was really helpful to me uh, on that end. And what I found was, fortunately, my wife uh, was also a first responder, so she could help, and I could uh, talk with her about things. But my last three years at the state police, it was a lot of death investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a fire investigator, so I did all the uh, mm -hmm. fatal fires and so forth for the state. And then I was also on the crime scene search team. So homicide, suicide, Ooh. kidnappings were a routine for me. It just was one call to the next to the next. Again, luckily, I had access to friends of mine that I could just kind of vent off. Mm -hmm. And then Sonny reaches out after I retire. And, you know, when you retire from law enforcement, you really feel like you're not contributing anymore because that's how, why I got in was to contribute. And I wasn't contributing for a while. So I was out in 09 and I was doing things, but I didn't feel like I really had an impact. And then when Sonny reached out to me, I said, yep, I can do this because I think I can have an impact here. 
And that was the driving motivation for me. And I looked at it and I said, you know, I saw a lot of stuff, but I had a lot of people that supported me. And it made it so much easier for me to uh, manage it on that end. You know, you see, you see the, the really tough stuff, but if you have a way of uh, looking at it and you have people that can provide you with a logical viewpoint rather than an emotional response, it really is helpful. But you also don't want to invalidate the emotional response, right? That's kind of the nuance of it, right? Yeah, well, you, you want to recognize it and you want to reframe it to something more positive. I knew that I couldn't have an impact on whatever crime scene I went to, but I knew I could do the best job I could. I can't change what happened. It, it was done. Uh, so I didn't get all wrapped up in that. What I got wrapped up in is there's a reverence that I wanted at the crime scenes, and there was a focus on if there's something here that's criminal in nature, I'll find out about it. Even if it's not criminal, if it's accidental, to help the family one right. way or the other, Didn't you need know. to find that <clears throat> stuff. So that's where my focus was, and I kind of distanced myself from what was, you know, the, the actual scene itself, the individual, and tried to make it more of a, this is what I'm trying to do, and I'm trying to help out the victim, and I'm trying to help out the family, and that's what made it right for me. Mm -hmm. That's allowed me to keep going anyway. Excellent. And, uh, and Bob, you're kind of the new, the new guy uh, on the team, but what yeah. drew you into doing this work and um, kind of being a partner to law enforcement in this way? Yeah, you know, so I came, came at uh, this from a little bit different perspective. Uh, as a first responder, you know, one of the, one of the things that is really impacted is your family life. Um, coming up through, you know, through the ranks and, and obviously putting in 20 years, that, that puts a lot of stress on the family. Um, so where I came um, to understand peer support, uh, you know, clinical resources is through, through that assistance. Um, through those resources, we were able to go ahead and, and work through some, some difficulties that, that my, my family was having. Um, and I really wanted to go ahead and impart that to the troopers that I was working with to, to show them that it was okay to go ahead and ask for help and mm -hmm. that it was okay to go ahead and get the, you know, get the assistance and that you could go ahead and make it through. So that was really important for me to go ahead and, and as a frontline supervisor to go ahead and, and make sure that my, my people understood that you know, it was a sign of strength instead of a sign of weakness. Right. Um, once I got onto the peer support program, you know, or, or the peer support team, um, that's really where I saw the benefits to it. And, you know, I, there's one call in particular that, you know, I can say that without that service, uh, we would have lost uh, probably two troopers, um, hmm. you know, through retirement, um, just because they, they weren't able to go ahead and cope with that call. So when I saw that, um, you know, that, that really invigorated me to go ahead and make sure that, that I did this for the rest of my life uh, or, or at least be a part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, through the work of Sonny, you know, obviously those, those troopers uh, made, it, made it back. So, you know, that was kind of, kind of where the, the aha moment was for me was to, to make sure that, nice. uh, that I was part of something like that. That's great. You often see, I think, um, or at least there's a perception that, you know, first responders are sort of, uh, you know, viewed as tough guys, right? Like a firefighter, a police officer, you know, there's that. And it, do you find that that makes it difficult when you s start talking about these sort of peer support programs? Is there a barrier there that you have to like kind of break down some of those perceptions in order for people to accept your help? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think it's important, one, to just really establish a rapport with these in individuals. If, if we walk in and we try and talk with somebody, you know, on day one, um, they're, they're not going to be as open as, as they, you know, they would be or they will be, you know, if we develop a relationship with them. So just, the, you know, through, through stopping into the police departments, through stopping into the fire departments and, and EMS agencies that, that we have contracts with and, and work with, um, you know, you develop those rapports and, and the, that rapport and you get to know the, the individuals that you're working with. So you develop that, that, that level of trust. Um, and then once you know, once, once you have that trust, we can go ahead and, and you know, kind of get get to the things uh, that that need to, to be worked on. So um, it's definitely important to go ahead and, and establish that with them. Yeah. I just, when Sunny, we were talking about this before, and Sunny, you mentioned to me that, that with first responders, and you sort of mentioned it, you're going on call to call to call, and each call, you have this feeling, and you, to get to the next call, you have to push it down. Next call, push it down, and pretty soon, it's up here, and you and it just explodes, and you need help. And that that brought it home for me that that's what the problem is with a lot of the first responders. They don't have time to decompress or or to get the help they need because they're going from one call to the next, and they have to perform at a hundred percent. So 
you push it down, right? That's yeah, Pat, that's exactly the, the problem. And, you know, the, the American Psychiatric Association in 2013 put police officers in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, and they used them as an example. And they said the, um, the repeated and, and often intense exposure, right. right, it causes post-traumatic stress. And prior to that, it had to be horrifying and life-threatening. Right now, they just said no, and the example right. is police officers writing the aversive details of a child abuse case um, can cause post traumatic stress. But that only doesn't mean police officers; that means social workers, right. school counselors, like anybody right. who's hearing the trauma stories of other people, right. uh, emergency room nurses. Right? Just think of the impact that trauma has on our population. Like right. nobody gets out. Unscathed. And especially when you were talking about the dispatchers, when you can't do anything about it, right. that must be awful because you know the beginning of it and you can't help There's except no press that button to send right. help. But and they're on the next yeah. call. Wow, yeah. Wow. That's it. I just wanted, I, I don't have a question to, for next, but I wanted people to know about your organization, Sunday, that you've achieved some seriously wonderful awards and a lot of recognition. And I think... First of all, I thank you all for doing what you do. You received the Champion Award from the New York City Department of Human Services for the training and stuff you did after 9-11, which you and I spoke about, and that was quite intense. So bless you for that. And the 2018 EMDR Advocacy Award for the Advanced Treatment of First Responders. So thank you Well, thank much. you. That was great. And we, we touched on this earlier, but could you explain what the EMDR treatment is and, um, and how is it different than you know, approaches that have been taken in the past? Sure. Um, so EMDR is a, um, a frontline accepted uh, psychotherapy today in 2022, but it wasn't always like that. Uh, it was developed by Francine Shapiro in the um, 1980s. Um, and uh, when it first um, hit the field of psychology, some people thought it was a little bit of quackery, a little voodoo, <laughs> because it involves moving your hands back and forth and moving your eyes along with uh, the hand movements uh, to help process a traumatic memory. But the science behind it is, is really clear, and it's, very, it's been researched pr almost more than any psychotherapy out there because of everybody questioned its effectiveness. Um, EMDR is based in the notion that all of us possess the ability to heal from trauma, um, just like our bodies have the ability to heal a cut, a wound, a broken bone. Uh, we, all, um, we all have this adaptive information processing system. And EMDR works on the internal memory networks, not the external re reformatting the information so I can change my thinking and change my behavior. Uh, EMDR is also found to be highly effective not only with trauma, but also with anxiety disorders, depression, eating disorders, phobias, right. and the list goes on and on and on. And at the core of the psychotherapy is facilitating the eye movements because we know that in rapid eye movement sleep is when our brains naturally update the information of our day, anything that's stuck in short-term memory, mm -hmm. which is the thing that we're using right yeah. now, or working memory. We're using working memory, listening to what we're saying and me listening to what you're asking me. That portion of short-term memory has to be formulated now into an adaptive encoded memory and stuck in long-term memory. And you remember meeting us at, right. at the radio station. Right. So the only way that happens is in REM sleep, when we stimulate the two hemispheres of our brain, right, the emotional brain encodes information one way, and our logical brain encodes information a different way, and our self-experience is the combination of both brains. EMDR posits the notion that, and, and we know this from neuroscience, right, we know that in a traumatic experience, if we are overwhelmed, Right? Our rational thinking brain really is turned off, right? It goes offline. And we operate with our survival brain. And just think, when you go to sleep at night and you only had one portion of my mind working, if you can't make meaning of an experience, you don't know how to encode it and you don't know where to put it. And like the memory networks need to be able to have enough information that they can retrieve it and put it back when, just like the library. Mm -hmm. right. Trauma memories are stored in dysfunctional memory networks, right? So they're repressed, 
right? Some people forget them or put them on the back burner. Mm -hmm. We've all heard these cliches. Right. What EMDR is able to do is it's able to allow the person a couple of things, two, two things happen. The eye movements create this Socratic movement, Socratic eye movement, which increases the strength of the parasympathetic nervous system. So the part of the nervous system that calms us down. So now you can ask somebody to go into a traumatic memory and while facilitating a little bit of a calming sensation so they can tolerate the traumatic experience. The EMDR therapist is trained to make sure that the person has a dual attention and one attention is to the traumatic memory while the other attention is to be with me in the room watching my huh. hand go back and forth. So I'm in the present with Pat while Pat's coaching me to go back into the trauma memory and just asking me to not judge myself, but just, just to notice what comes up. And so what, we've been fa what we found to, for EMDR to be so effective with is the fact that it can get into these dysfunctional memory networks and allow a more adaptive memory networks to make links to what's not fully understood. And then you know, we facilitate the session. We ask the person to go home, uh, do things to enhance their a good night's sleep, because we want REM sleep to be the natural right. reprocessing of the brain. So everything that we put into short-term memory during the EMDR session is literally on a silver platter to be recognized and reprocessed in the natural REM sleep. And natural REM sleep is like dream sleep is in REM sleep. And that is what we call natural EMDR, right? When we dream, our brain is showing us bits and pieces of information that a lot of time consciously we can't make any sense of. Mm -hmm. And this is really the power of EMDR, that it's able to, it doesn't need language. We don't ask people to talk to us when we're doing the eye movements. Every 20 seconds I'd ask them to stop and just take a deep breath, and we ask them to take a deep breath because when you take a deep breath, right, you increase the vagal tone, right, the thing that keeps you in the present, right, keeps you calmer. And then I ask them, what's the last thing you were thinking of? And they may say, you know, I'm out of, I'm out of call with Mark. And then I say, go with that, right, because now I know he's in a memory. And it doesn't matter what I know about the memory because his or her mind knows how to show them the information so. that's going to make the experience more adaptive, and therefore, if we can make it more adaptive, we can get rid of the irrational belief they may have had. And you said it earlier, Pat. You know, um, we do a tough job, and most first responders have an irrational belief about themselves that they didn't do enough. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so let me ask you, if I'm your client. While you're doing this, am I awake? Am I conscious? Yes. Am I, do I have my eyes open? Yeah. What, what am I doing yeah. while you're asking me this? Am I in some kind of tra trance? No. Um, no, 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 seriously. No. <laughs> so, I, um, I, no, you're fully conscious, you're fully yeah. with me in the room, and the interesting thing about it is that um, the eye movements we know, um, it gives the working memory a task. You, you, you have to follow my hand. Yeah. So when we're manipulating working memory, and I'm, you know, and I'm directing you towards a target traumatic memory, we're adding the target memory into working memory as it's being manipulated. Wow. And you're fully awake, and I'm fully reading your body sensations, and every once in a while I may stop and say, are you doing okay? People, some people cry, some people yell, right? Because like they, they're thinking of something. That's right. right. Uh -huh. So there's three different ways that we can facilitate, we call the eye movements, the bilateral right. stimulation, right? Two hemispheres. Uh, with technology, we have tappers that people hold in their hands and they have alternating vibrating. And some people do really do a good job at reprocessing because they can close their eyes and they can bring up the image. For people who get overwhelmed in bringing up the image, we have them keep your eyes open. So now you're in the room with me because your eyes are open and you're watching me. Or I have a device that's a blue light. It's a light bar. The lights go back and forth. And mm. you're in the room with me. And my job as the M EMDR therapist is to make sure, one, that you don't get overwhelmed. right? Because getting overwhelmed only creates more harm. right? right? And two, that I can offer a more adaptive way of you understanding what you're experiencing by, we, say, we call them cognitive interweaves, right? I may say something, you may say something to me like, you know, I remember this experience, you know, with, with, my, with my grandfather, you know, where he got me this thing. 
And, and I may say to you, well, is that a positive experience? And you even say it's a positive experience. And I said, well, what is th I want you to reflect about what that says about you as a person. And so now you go back into that memory. And now what, that, what you've done is you've opened up a positive memory network. <laughs> as you have opened up prior to that, because we don't right. start with a bomb, you opened up that negative memory network. Right. So while, the, while you were just thinking about you know, a sad or, or traumatic experience, and for some reason your mind showed you this experience with your grandfather, and I capitalize on that by now expanding the positive memory network, because the positive memory network interweaves with the dysfunctional memory network, and you make a more adaptive understanding of the experience. We should do a whole show on this. Yeah, we should oh, do a whole show on this. Fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. So, because um, we have uh, so many questions, but so if the, if it's a very bad memory, and the person is like maybe freaking out and like, oh my god, this this happened to me, and I forgot it because I pushed it down. What do you do in response? How do you keep them to know that it's okay? That what happened happened and well that's what this whole manual is about. <laughs> All right, never mind. <laughs> no, so <laughs> there's a really good. Yeah, well, do you do this too? Yeah, he does this. No, he yeah. does. Yeah. We we focus on, you know, first of all, making sure the client is safe. Right. We focus on making sure they're stable enough through all of these exercises, <clears throat> right? Making sure that they have uh, done some. We call it resourcing. Right, so I'm going to build up my resources. Well, what are my resources? I'm going to make sure that you can compartmentalize if you get overwhelmed. So there's a container exercise, which is in here. We're going to make sure that you have a calm, safe place that you can right. draw upon if you get overwhelmed. So before we go into this stuff, right, there's, there's eight phases of EMDR. Right? Before we go into it, we make sure that the client is prepared and we conceptualize their target memory in a manner that's safe and that we know that we can help them. And the, the good thing about it is we don't evaluate them. They're evaluating themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all, it's all done internally, and this right. is why it's so effective. Now, what's the difference but between... But they're telling you what they're remembering. They're yeah. sharing that with you. Well, they've, they're in the memory network, and that's what we want. Right. The difference about cognitive behavioral therapy and EMDR therapy is cognitive behavioral therapy requires the skill of the therapist to ask the right question at the right time so you can draw upon... Uh, the experience or, or the feeling, the emotion, um, or the body sensation, right? Wow. And then offers an opportunity to help you understand it differently. But that's done all externally, right? It, it's about convincing you, right, and giving mm -hmm. you a different perspective. EMDR works. I treated a person who had 40 years of going to a therapist. Um, and and he, that person had come to me, and I did two sessions with him. And after the second session, he says, oh, my God, I got, I got up. I was able to go to work, and, and he suffered from depression. And he said, when's it going to come back? And I said, <laughs> well, if, if you processed what, you, what right. I think you processed, it ain't coming back. Wow. I haven't seen him since. Wow. That's great. That's pretty Brad, amazing. Glad you asked that question. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> Good so, <laughs> so there is a training for this, uh, I believe, that's coming up, right? That you can become uh, certified in this sort of um, uh, in this sort of therapy. It, coming up at the end of January, and so about six weeks, is that right? Yeah. So uh, January thirtieth uh, through February second, um, it's a four day class. Four day uh, class. Okay. Um, pretty much, we're working through. Um, you know, Sunny does a, a large section on. Uh, psychoeducation, so really just understanding the brain, how the body processes things, how you know how we are different as first responders, how we process trauma and 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 stress differently, um, recognizing that stress and trauma, and then we talk about uh, screening for the severity of it. You know, uh, you know, just making sure that that we're handling things or, or, or people on the peer support programs are, are handling things at the appropriate level, um, doing assessments. You know, really listening and communicating uh, the different steps or, or, you know, listening to, to what the individuals are saying. And then really, um, you know, looking at what the next step would be. You know, is it something that, uh, you know, somebody like Mark and I can go ahead and handle? You know, is it a life coaching thing? Is it, um, or is it something that we need to go ahead and make a referral to? Um, and then obviously, if, if it does rise to that level of, of needing a referral, then obviously we'd bring in qualified clinicians uh, like Sunny and, and obviously right. people that, that work with us or, or others. Um, and really just making sure that, you know, we're, we're doing everything that we can for, for the people. And so this, the people who would attend this are, are people like um, healthcare workers, educators, like people that are 
in roles that would be okay. exposed to uh, these sorts of potential situations um, and helps them to identify when themselves or a peer may need some of these services. Is that a correct Both. understanding? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really for self, you know, self-reflection as well as you know, working, working for others. Mm -hmm. um, really anybody in you know, the first responder or, or frontline workers, uh, you know, we're, we're really targeting this training for I think the definition over time of, of frontline workers must have changed from what I'm, I'm hearing. People weren't looking at the, uh, the dispatcher or some of the other that you they've expanded it to understand what their role is and that they they could be impacted. Educators, too. social Edu workers, right. Um, right. mental health professionals. Yeah. I mean, we didn't talk about that years ago. No, we talked not about at all. Police, no, fire, EMT. It was just, yeah, the yeah. big three. Yeah. The the beauty about this training is that it's based in EMDR's stabilization and grounding techniques, which you can teach anybody. Um, and the peer support teams um, are going to get trained in a group intervention. EMDR, where right. we actually do all of what Bob said, the uh, stabilization and grounding, mindfulness, you know, positive memory, give them an adaptive belief, screen them to make sure they can go through this process. And the beauty about it is that if you have a peer team in, of educators, you can, um, you can help each other uh, right. and help yourself as well. And, you know, in the TSR manual that we put together, Traumatic Stress Relief Training, incorporates all of the EMDR techniques, both individually and in a group as well as peer support. That's great. The you thing, the, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to add one more thing yep. is the really nice thing about the, the program itself is it's proactive. So it's not waiting to that point where now you've had someone reach that level where everything's spilling out. Right. You're trying to catch them long before right. that. You're teaching them the techniques on how to identify things, how to manage stress, how to understand how it works right. so that it doesn't rise to that level. That's really where I see the difference right. in, in a lot of the stuff that we do is we're very proactive. What's the, what's the, feed, the response you get attendance? Because you had a, a seminar on November 1st, and you had a keynote speaker, a world recognized. Yeah. What, how many people were there and what, because you, you had it, you were calling it Change the Lens, right. which I thought was interesting uh, in itself. So how did that go? It went really well. I think we had in the morning session about 75 first responders, oh, and then in the afternoon session we had over 100 um, mental health workers, social workers, teachers. We really don't know exactly, yeah. um, but but through the help with the Depart uh, Vermont Department of Mental Health, we were able to get the message out there. Right. And, um, you know, and I think the the idea of giving it that title, changing the lens, right? Like looking at stress management, right. and, and again, a lot of these professions are exposed to trauma, looking at how we can treat um, stress and trauma effectively. But it, well, this is a new paradigm shift, right? You yeah. know, EMDR has really brought something really new and exciting to, to the mental health field where we're showing people that you don't have to be a licensed professional to be trained in the TSR, right. EM, EMDR early interventions. That's great. Well, I think the most important thing is it's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. If you get anything out of the day, yeah. whatever, that if you think it's okay, it's, it's okay. You need help, ask. Absolutely. And that's, that's the most important. So we have, uh, we have less than 15 minutes left, and I want to make sure we touch on uh, suicide, oh. um, suicide prevention, which I think is a major piece of uh, mental health for, for first responders. They tend to have a higher uh, incidence of, uh, of suicide. Um, and have you seen these, uh, have you seen these um, methods to be effective in helping to prevent suicide? And is that one of the things that you're trying to address aside from just the well-being of, of first responders? Because our numbers aren't going down. They're not going down. No, they're yeah. not, they're going up. Well, you know, uh, obviously it's a concern of, of us three because we get the call at two o'clock in the morning. Um, we've been um, successful in being proactive enough to get people to call us when they really need help. Uh, the thing, I, the incident I was describing earlier, I was actually in Northfield and Mark was at home and this person was on his way to the center and, and Mark got there just in time and that is a success story. Um, and the other thing about suicide is, you know, we know that we can help people who have a temporary state of mind where they feel like they can't take it anymore, right? We know that we can help them if they ask for help, if they ask for help, or if you are not asking for help that somebody close to you can identify mm -hmm. 
that you may need help. And, you know, I'm going to just break down the myth right now. If you ask somebody, are you thinking about suicide, it doesn't promote, you know, promote them to do more, you know, to, to get closer to oh, committing suicide or be right. successful at it. And the other myth is, too, is that we want people to say, hey, I'm thinking I'm in a really dark spot. And we have shown through the work that we're doing with our organizations that, that it's not a career killer for any one of these men and women huh. who find themselves. Like, the, the numbers in, like, we are three times the suicide rate of the general public. And we are, we are professionals. And wh why is that happening, right? Why, why is this rate of, of self-harm so high in these professions? Stigma and lack of resources. Right? Think about that, right? That's, uh, I'm not going to lay anybody. If I, if I tell on Bob that he's suicidal, I'm going to ruin his job. But so, that's not true. So, right? so. it's not true anymore. Yeah. And, and the organizations that we work with, work with know that. And so we, I love talking about this topic because yeah. there are a lot of misunderstandings. One, if somebody is suicidal, can you ever become a first responder again? Absolutely. Because, and two, we know that there are traits of people who um, uh, become or threaten suicide, and that is... They have a mental health condition that could be transitory. It's usually depression. Right. We know that we all, or some of us, resort to alcohol because it's socially acceptable. And we have access to firearms in Vermont. Right. And if we know that, why, why can't we help people and say, it's OK to say I'm, I'm suicidal and I need help? And there's not one experience, right, in, in at least my 20 years of doing this work, where somebody asking for help who's had that kind of a condition, could not keep their job. But you must have built up such a great level of trust with that person. Because I think they don't, I think if they met you once and they wouldn't call you, you, you must have developed something very special between you and your client or who, uh, because they wouldn't call you, would they? I mean, that's. Well, Pat, what I would say is that the Vermont law enforcement community um, knows that the center is out there. They know that we're willing to do this work. And I have gotten calls from police officers from I don't police even officers, know. Police officers, right. Saying, hey, I have a, a colleague or a peer right. who's really struggling. And, and this guy right here, how many trips have you taken to Boston? Because there's a program in Boston. It's an right. in-hospital program. He's been three times in the last six months. Three. Them, uh, three. Talk the to leader them? program. Oh, yeah. No, to yeah. bring people who need some oh, help. It's an ah. inpatient yeah. Oh, I see. Program. Okay. Yeah. 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 Bob wow. didn't even know this. I didn't know this person. And he showed up at their doorstep and said, get in my car. I'm taking you down there. Oh, and no kidding. Yeah. yeah. They weren't even part of our program. Yeah. It wow. was just, but you know, they, someone we heard about and we felt we could do something. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. And they came and they went and there you go. Yeah. It was, it was a, a fairly seamless process, you know, making contact with the hospital down there just to go ahead and, and make sure that there, that there was room. Um, you know, getting them COVID tested, and I'm bringing and, and you then somebody, and then we're yeah. we're we're on the road. You wow! Know? The people really want need to, to be able to, or they, they really need to want to do the work. Yeah, uh, it's not something that I can go ahead and force on them. Um, you know, but you know, to to Sunny's point, um, it's not just educating the the upper management. You know, along these with these with these agencies, uh, you know, police chiefs and fire chiefs uh, um, about suicide prevention and. and how to handle them? It's really getting that information down to the to the to the street level, so that people are not afraid of, of you know saying I'm having I'm having issues or I'm in a dark place. Right. Um, making sure that they understand, like Sunny says, it's not a career ender. Um, making sure that it's it's not going to impact them, you know, for for career advancement um, or you know special duty assignments. Um, and making sure that they have that that understanding of mm -hmm. if this process takes place. What are the steps moving forward? And, and right. that's really what, what we've been focusing on, um, you know, with, with our contracted agencies, just to make sure that they have an understanding um, right down, you know, from the highest person in, in the organization down to the lowest member, you know, the, the newest member on, on the force, right. that they have an understanding of what the steps are moving forward from here. So it's not, it's not a A lot scary. of our first responders are volunteers. Um, they're not paid professionals where the management can say, you go to this. Um, they really have to understand and, and need the help themselves because they're they're on their own time, right? Wow. Well, yeah, and you know, and I think the, the the challenge in Vermont is serving that population, right? Serving that right. population, uh, the the you know, the fire department in the Northeast Kingdom, right. that, you know, Berlin, Vermont, right here. Yeah. They're all volunteers, yeah. right? Right, yeah. and uh, you know, and. 
Pat, you know, I think we've all made that commitment. There's never been a call that we, you know, have not um, serviced, um, right. regardless of who right. they are. And, and I think that's how the center is committed to the community, by providing these services that we know are really needed. That's right. I read that uh, when we were talking one time, but we were talking about cultural competence and how that's important. Could you explain that in the work that you do to understand the people you're dealing with? <laughs> We've all lived it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't much that, that there isn't much that anybody's gone through that I I personally haven't. Really. And neither one of these, absolutely. So you, you understand know, where they're coming absolutely. from. Absolutely. Whether it's financial, <laughs> whether it's personal, you know, right. relationship. Uh, you can go to any call. I've been to every every call you've ever been to and Really nasty ones, Been there, done and that. you know, and others that were difficult in the sense that you couldn't do anything. So we can all relate. And you know, you had asked a question earlier about you know the rapport thing, and and it just it comes across. I mean, if I talk to somebody about something or Bob or Sonny, we've experienced it. Right. You can look in our eyes, and you know we we understand it, and that's where a lot of it comes. So it isn't necessarily having to develop this huge rapport um, on that end because we talk the talk, we walk the walk, we've been there, we understand it, and we share that. And when we uh, share that, hey, listen, I've lost a job. Right. I know what it's like. Right. It's devastating. I can relate to this. That barrier goes down. Right. And well, the, that does build the trust because they know they're talking to somebody who understands. But it, it's, it's like this. Yeah, right. Yeah, it right. can be that fast. Yeah. You know, on a first time, um, and fortunately or unfortunately, anyone that I've met first time, I've been able to relate to everything right. with them. Right. So, able to find some common ground mm -hmm. so that you can talk and they realize, listen, we're here. The only reason we're doing this is because we really believe that we can help somebody. And, you know, we, we know that through experience, it has been successful. Yeah. Do you deal with children much? Because speaking of suicide, it's our teenagers that uh, have got the highest percentage, and they live in a very difficult environment, I think, compared to you know what I remember growing up, which is a long time, hard to remember. It, the internet but, yeah, exactly. didn't exist yeah. at internet. that point in time. It's, it's called a telephone. It was a um, notebook. <laughs> no, exactly. Passing notes in yeah, class. Like it's yeah, playing yeah. outside. What a concept. Yeah. Um, kick the can under the streetlight. But how, I mean, do you deal with young people? Yeah, so we, um, so I have two mental health clinics. So we have the Center for Respond to Wellness, and we also have the Institute for Trauma Recovery and Resiliency, and we're working um, with the general population as well. And we have seven trauma-trained therapists and two yoga teachers who work oh. between these two clinics, and we provide services for all the family members of first oh. responders as well. So, right. so we do work with children. Yeah, great. Well, and do you find that the, the I'm just curious. Do you find that the um, Children of first responders tend to be uh, exposed to more trauma than a typical uh, child might, or you know, does a does a first responder bring that home with them to some degree, telling stories or, or anything like that, or is it kind of comparable to the general public? Oh no, no. Um, you know, uh, f first of all, you know, uh, we used to joke about um, you know being traumatized together. You don't actually recognize it, mm -hmm. and so you bring it home. Uh, oh. your, your your spouse may recognize it. Your yeah. children may recognize it. You know, when we develop the 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 sense of what the world is, the world could be dangerous and the world could be very tragic, right? And you have a teenage daughter and they want to date a boy. Oh. Uh, you know, yeah. certain dynamics take place <laughs> at home and oh, vice Marcus versa. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, my, my son getting his license and, you know, it's it, t tomorrow night's going to be snow, right? We know what the tent, like, like you lock them down. Right, right. Yeah. We, right. And, you know, when we provide... Um, some workshops for families and we pro provide education so families can know what to expect and, and you know, w we do um, uh, all kinds of uh, preventative work with the, the, the whole system, right? So, so the first responder has, you know, their bubble and the bubble really lives the same life. I think. And, you know, Bob still has kids at home and, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can speak to personal experience. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like Sunny, Sunny mentioned the, the driving thing, and, you know, that was a big thing for, for me. And, and when my daughter got, got her license is, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of project all these 
horrible things that, that you've encountered, you know, with, with teenagers and, and vehicles. And uh, so you are very overly cautious. You know, you, you develop that, that thick skin and, and you don't want anything to, to happen. You don't want to, to be another statistic. So, um, you know, working through that, you know, you kind of, uh, fortunately, I have a good sounding board on, on my wife is a, is a great sounding board. So she kind of, <laughs> she kind of says, all right, you Take know, dial, dial it back a little bit, dad. <laughs> yeah. and, and, you know, yeah. we've, uh, you know, but, you know, again, it does have a serious impact on, on the families, families of first So see them riding in the car and say, is there some, oh, it's just my dad. <laughs> yeah, it's just my dad. <laughs> right. Right. In, in the, the back, back seat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My poor just, kids, when I was yeah, teaching really. them how to drive, God, I, I would say to them, what's the speed limit? If they didn't know it and they were going over, that's three points on your license. You get 10 points. <laughs> oh, no. I'm taking, I'm taking it away for this amount of time. Oh, on no. and on. It, it was terrible. So me. that your kids hated you and they were learning yeah. how to drive. <laughs> <laughs> one, one's uh, an educator, uh, been in it for 20-some odd years. The other one's an FBI agent. So. Well, there you go. Oh, They're going to do the same thing to their kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly. It's funny because, like, so my mom's a nurse. Um, and uh, the thing you were talking earlier about uh, uh, getting a motorcycle license, I was not allowed to look at a motorcycle <laughs> <laughs> growing up. Not off the table, not allowed to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, you know, your, your mom was probably, you know, carrying the... Uh, well, I won't, won't get into but your mom has seen all of that, right? Yeah, and, right. And, Been there, done that. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Well, there, I was kind of old when I got my license. I think it was in my 40s. No, I, not that I recall. <laughs> <laughs> I remember right. very Everybody's young. Like, Don't give that woman a license. Energetic. Sonny, we've got just a few seconds. you want to let people know how they can contact you and where to see your website and that sort of stuff? Yeah, Pat. So uh, we're in Colchester in the fort, um, right across the street from the old state police barracks. Oh, right. Yep. And um, we're at www.vcrw. No, that's not right. We're at, <laughs> Wait, scratch we're that. at VT. <laughs> we're at vtrespondowellness.com. I hardly ever go to my own website. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, our phone number is really easy. It's six six one hero. Oh, nice. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I like that. Anyway. Thank you, gentlemen, very much. Thank you for joining us, Ben, tonight. It was fun. Thank you all for tuning in. I know you like this program. This is Pat McDonald, your co-host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Thank you all very Thank you, much. Pat.